Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 71. And again, as always, we have a special guest on the show. But before we get there, just remember that if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast and our sultry voices aren't enough for you, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash camera shake, where you can see our lovely faces in full Technicolor. Also lovely. there, hit the subscribe button. Yeah, lovely. Ooh. Right. Anyway, thank you very much. there, man. hit the subscribe button, do the bell thing, whatever YouTubers tell you to do. That's cool. But for now... This is it, Camera Shake episode 71. And today's guest is none other than the photographer, filmmaker, writer, YouTuber, and, as I've just found out, fellow musician, Sean Tucker. Sean, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. How are you? We doing, are very good. Doing all right, fellow musician. I didn't know that. Exactly. What do you play? Uh, keys. Yeah, so I, was, I, was, uh, I used to sort of play synth and sort of front bands with vocals um, huh? back in the day. It was a long time ago now. <laughs> Excellent. This sounds like there's a band coming together. We know. We've got a massive band. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we're like Frank Dorhoff, yourself, Scott Kelby, I think. Adam Lerner. <laughs> yeah, Adam yeah. Lerner. I know it's a whole band there. Love it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. So, Sean, you've just recently um, moved to the lovely Yorkshire. Yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously really different from London, where I came from before. Um, yeah. But it's been like a welcome change. I think, like, when I moved back to London... Gosh, it would have been almost 10 years ago now. I did it because I knew I needed to get work coming in again. And it's, it's easier to be in a city and try to get everything um, working. But I always had in mind, you know, when I, when I built things to a stage where it didn't matter where I lived, that I wanted to get out because it's a yeah. great city. And I, I visit often. I mean, I'm down again this week. Um, and I'll still, you know, go down to shoot every now and again. But honestly, it's not really the place I want to live. I think I've always been a a country boy. <laughs> I'd prefer to be out where it's a bit quieter. And where I am now is, uh, it's just north of the city of York. Um, and m my house is just on the edge of the North York Moors, which is a beautiful mm. um, area of the country where it's, you know, uh, lots of little villages, but lots of sort of farmland as well, and moorland and, and woodland. And it's, yeah, it's just a lovely place to be. So I can go visit the cities when I need to. Um, to photograph or to have meetings or whatever, then retreat to the country so it's nice and quiet and live there instead. Because I never look forward to going back to my tiny London flat, but I actually look forward to coming <laughs> home here. It's really nice. So absolutely amazing. You know, I've only been fortunate enough to go up to that area of the country once, believe it or not. And that's quite sad, isn't it? But I remember driving through, we were going to the, um, funny enough, just outside of York itself as well. And it is stunning. I've never been there. Absolutely stunning. It reminded me of where we went the other day um, towards Wales, those, those kind of areas. It's at, oh, absolutely stunting area. Very, very, very lucky. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, beautiful. a beautiful, beautiful place. I, Sean, do I imagine that, um, you know, you, you mentioned there that you, you know, once you got yourself to a place where it didn't matter where you lived to do what you do, have you found yourself needing to adapt in any kind of way moving from London to York? Photography wise or life wise, I mean, cause it's, it's kind of too, I mean, this, yeah. this moving here this year has obviously been like a, a, a really chaotic move for me. So it's hard to work mm. out life wise. What, I mean, it feels like a lot of adapting has had to happen for me this year in general, but that's the, you know, that's to do with complicated life stuff. I mean, this is sure. the first time I was buying a house. So that's a massive shift. Um, my wife left very suddenly back in January. Um, that's a massive like life upheaval as well. Um, not knowing kind of what's going on there and having to start life mm -hmm. again. So to work out kind of what's had to change because of all that crazy stuff that's been going on and what's had to change just because you're moving to a different part of the country is quite difficult to separate out at the moment. It's all a bit of a mess. Um, plus, you know, things like, um, you know, having a book come out that I've been working on for a while. It's all, there's so much going on. I, it feels really chaotic but I'm not sure what to blame that on because it's a mix of mm. things. Um, but photography wise, yeah, I mean, it, it has, I, I am adapting, but I mean, I, I knew that would happen and I was looking forward to the challenge because I, I think if you stay in one place, it, it's, it's great and you can dig deep and you can get to know an area to photograph quite intimately, but you can also start to get stuck in ruts of your own making where you visit the mm. same spots over and over and you do the same sort of thing over and over. And I, I'd felt like for myself, I was looking forward to a change. So moving up here, you know, where I might 
go for a walk in the forest or, or, or go, there's a beautiful valley near me called Kirkdale, which is, you know, it starts with a, with a 13th century stone church. And then you go up the valley into woodland and then through farmlands and then up onto the moors. Um, I don't know how to shoot that stuff. I have no idea how to shoot that. So it's not, it's not my comfort zone or going, go down to Whitby, which is a little fishing uh, town down the road as well. Like all those sort of things is they're not areas I know how to shoot, but I know that by starting at the bottom and working it out, I'm going to be a better photographer if I can work it out and more uh, varied in my skill set and be able to sort of travel better and take photographs of whatever is in front of me rather than just camping out in Soho every week and taking yeah. the same sort of shots, you know? So it's, yeah, there's a lot of adjustment, but it's all good. And, and I knew it was coming and was kind of looking forward to it. This, yeah. I think that's, yeah. you know, that's an added effect. It's, um, you know, as you say, if you, if you go back to London, <clears throat> you know, every so often, it's, I think, you know, having that distance and just being in a different environment and actually experiencing, ex, um, experiencing the space, you know, actually the geographical space and the mental space um, in, in a place like, you know, like Yorkshire, I guess, when you come back to London, you start seeing London with new eyes. Is that, do you feel that's happening already or? It did actually a little, I didn't expect that, but that's, that's kind of true. You know, I've been down, been back down twice, mm, three, actually three or four times since I've left and I'll go down again this week. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I had the last time I was down, I was out with a friend of mine, um, Joshua Jackson, you know, look him up on Instagram. He's amazing. A street photographer. Um, and we often used to go and sort of shoot together around London, maybe once a week or so when I was down there. We went for a walk and I had one of the most productive days of photography that I've had there. And that's since having been away for three or four months and coming back down and I was trying to work it out and it might be to do with that. It might be because I, I wasn't in it every day. I was approaching it slightly fresh um, and, and seeing different things or trying new things instead of sort of repeating those well-worn grooves that you, that you sort of sit in. So yeah, I think that's probably true, but that's like a really new realization for me that'll be very interesting to see how that develops for you over the you know the next few years if you're only if you're going back down maybe you know just for argument's sake once a quarter you're and you would have picked up new things in the way you shoot the style of shoot, shooting that you do in in york in um when you're outside and you're surrounding yourself with different people on a daily basis as well um you know, I watched one of your recent videos. Um, apologies, I've forgotten um, your friend's name now, but he's a stunning woodland photographer. Stunning. Oh, Simon Baxter, yeah. Oh, my God. Some of his fa mm. absolutely fantastic yeah, stuff. I mean, you can learn so much from someone like that because he's in it and doing has been doing that for years. Yeah. And you'll then take that and come back to London, maybe do some street down here, and it'll be so fresh. You'll know, try things that you're trying in there. And it, I, I'm really intrigued as to how that all will develop over the coming few years for you. It's, it's one of my favorite things about doing those little sort of documentaries on other photographers that I do on my channel a lot now is, is you kind of take a little piece of everybody after you've spoken to them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone teaches you a little new thing and it's not that you want to go off and sort of copy what they do. I mean, that would be a, a big mistake because you'd sidetrack what you're, what you're actually moving towards, but, but everyone teaches you something different. And Simon in particular is someone who, who teaches me about composition like nobody else, because he walks into a woodland and on, I've been in with him a few times. Like, and you walk in and I can't make sense of anything I'm looking at. It's, it is just a mess of branches and tree trunks. It's proper, <laughs> proper visual chaos. Hmm. And he makes little micro moves. He's like, no, no, stand here. Look, just, and then just slide slightly to the right like this. And everything just kind of snaps into place. And he knows how to do that really fast now, just from having done it for five to six years. And I think, I think when I shoot a frame, um, if I'm out and about on the street, I, I traditionally look for very clean frames, very clean images. And I think it's probably because I'm a bit of a chicken when it comes to composition. So make sure there are less elements to arrange and then it looks cleaner. And it's easier to get to a pleasing composition. But, but he pushes me to go, well, why don't, you, why don't you try and find chaos and make sense of it? Even, even if you are in a city and not in a woodland, like, that's that's what I take away from him is to be braver by including more in the frame and working harder to put everything in its right place, which he's a, a ninja at. I found woodlands very difficult generally to photograph. It's it really scares me. It all looks the same. To an extent, well, it's I find this I find this very difficult. It's exactly like you said. You know, I find it very difficult to get a decent composition or to even know what I'm looking at. Mm. You know, um, 
And I've, I've been out a few times actually with the intent of creating some photographs, especially with my daughter. Um, and um, I always find that I always fall back to the kind of safe zone where I actually put my daughter in the frame yeah. under yeah. a tree or something, you know? Yeah. So it's like- Give a, a subject, yeah. Yeah, give it a subject, but it's, it feels like a little bit of a, you know, get out of jail free card, basically. <laughs> I'll just, you know, she's got, she's a, you know, cute kid. I'll just put her in the frame and, yeah. and that's it. Simon Baxter's YouTube channel is really one worth going and taking a look at because yeah. he shows you how he thinks about it. And and it, it really makes a lot of sense. And there's lots of layers to it. Like he's on the mm. one layer, he's sort of, he knows all the individual trees. He knows why they grow there and, and what that means about the area and the soil and the weather and all that hmm. kind of stuff. And then he knows, and then on top of that, he'll add a, a seasonal layer. So they change through each season. He, he might go back and photograph those things at different seasons because they look very different. Mm-hmm. And then he'll, there's weather conditions as well. So he might want uh, light in there. He might want early morning light. He might want fog to kind of separate out the layers because it's quite confusing. And then he'll add a, a story layer on top of him where he'll, where he almost creates characters out of these trees. And when he's got all that going on and you, you, that's, you're adding all that to your composition, it's not just shapes. It's now, it's now um, the fact that this one tree has wound itself around another tree and that middle tree has died and hollowed out. And it's, you know, when you, when you, when you realize he's not just shooting a tree, it's like he's, he's showing you things. And then, you know, I mean, he, he, he loves Lord of the Rings and the Ents and those kind of things. So he's also adding, like, he's also almost <laughs> personifying these things. I think when you do that, it's easier to make something as what we walk past every day, we walk past a thousand trees a day that we think of quite mundane he makes it a subject by adding all those layers to it, which is quite cool. You can really go in depth with all that, can't you? Maybe it's, we should go on a hard. We should go on a woodland photography trip. That's what we should yeah. be doing. Without putting ourselves in the face, eh? Yeah, that could be interesting. <laughs> okay. We did we were challenged not too okay. long ago um to do some street photography, which we did. And actually I don't think we failed. I think we did okay. We no, we didn't fail. We came out with something different to what I think we intended on yeah, going with. But true. we came out with some good stuff, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, Nina wasn't so complimentary. No, I'm joking. But <laughs> Nina, Nina was very complimentary, but she was right. We ended up coming out with, I certainly did, with more portraits than street photography. Yeah, true. And she's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. So if you, if you want to check out that episode, you can see it in a link up here. We'll put it in there somewhere. Um, but yeah, we went, we went into town, um, did some street photography, and then we, we had our, our efforts critiqued. Uh, but one of our guests afterwards, which was, you know, probably <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah, no, um, there's, uh, there's a phrase for putting something out on the table there for that. And uh, yeah. But also, I mean, the other thing that, you know, the other reason why we did that actually in the first place was that, you know, it was at the time, it was at the, at the beginning, you know, when things started to open up again a little bit and we could actually go back into town because with all the lockdowns and everything, you know, it started to feel like we were really, really cut off from, you know, civilization and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, and yeah. so it was just like one of these little fun trips to celebrate and also to learn something at the same time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we did, for sure, sure. So Sean, what I love about your channel and, and have always loved since I first came across your channel when weirdly your name popped up on a map of Rickmansworth. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I lived there for about a year, a long time did ago. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that mind. explains it because yeah. I live I live in Rickmansworth, right? Right. And so and so uh, I was actually looking at I was looking at a map, um, and I was just looking at whether Google had actually placed my photography business, you know, correctly on the map. And I was like, Sean Tucker photography. I'm like, who is this Sean Tucker? <laughs> <laughs> so I checked it out. I'm like, huh? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. the most um, random way anyone's discovered me. <laughs> I know, right? And so, but but then I came across your your YouTube channel, and I mean, this goes back, I guess. This must be like three years ago or something like that. Mm. But anyway, so I came across your your YouTube channel and uh, and immediately your videos really stood out from from everything else that that was on there at the time, and still and still does and and not not necessarily because you know you initially like you, you not because you maybe used to teach different things, but it was just the way that you brought that across and the thoughtfulness. That went that went with it, you know, and that really sort of struck a chord for me. So, you know, there's a lot of um, 
a lot of philosophical thought that goes in it and um and so on and so forth so how did you first get into well first of all how come you lived in Rickmansworth? and secondly <laughs> how did uh how how did you go about launching your youtube career i mean the Rickmansworth question is easy i i came back to the uk from south africa in 2012 i think mm -hmm. um And I came back because I couldn't get work in South Africa. Um, so I, yeah. I needed to make a plan. And I, I uh, gosh, I would have been early 30s. And uh, yeah, I just came back with a, with a suitcase and a backpack. I didn't really own anything. I didn't have anything. I just had to, I had to bounce and try and make a plan. And um, my godfather lives in Rickmansworth. So he kindly took me in and let me rent a room from him while mm -hmm. I uh, looked for work and then um, I, I was lucky to find work a month after I landed. And then I started, um, commuting because the office where I was working was in Twickenham, which if you know, TFL is a mission to get to, you've got to go, uh -huh. well, you've got to go like, um, what is it? Uh, you've got to take, take the, the, the main line into Baker street and then across from Baker street to Waterloo. And then you've got to go Waterloo out. out to Twickenham. So it was an hour and 45 minutes each way. No on six trains backwards and forwards to work every day. So I didn't stay too long after I got that job <laughs> because that wasn't the life I wanted to lead. So then I moved to Clapham, which was a lot easier to get from Clapham Junction yeah. out to Twickenham. It was kind of yeah. one train instead of three, and it was 40 minutes instead of an hour and 45 each way. Um, so that's the short answer for Rickmansworth. And then YouTube kind of came up because... Um, I mean, at the time I was still working, doing uh, product photography for a company um, that sold furniture. Uh, so that was kind of the day job. And, you know, I was, I was grateful that I could make money as a photographer, but it wasn't the most creative sort of photography at all. It was a, a real production line of you have to shoot these 50 sofas today and they all have to have exactly the same six angles. And, you know, I'd I designed a studio space with an infinity cove and lighting so I didn't have to move it too much between each shot. It was just bring the sofa in, lay it down on the marks that I had, and then it would be fire through, you know, a front on shot, seven eights, seven eight raised, a flip it round, seven eight reversed, and then three detailed shots of the, the foot, the arm, and the backrest. So that would be every single. So you can imagine you do that 50 times a day. You can't, you can't faff too much with like, oh, well, you know, I want to get artistic on this one. You've got, you got a lot to get done. <laughs> and then it's cutouts and drop shadows and post-production to get it looking clean on a white background and, you know, sort of mm. fixing creases and all that stuff. Like it is photography, but it's not creative photography where you feel fulfilled at the end of the day. Yep. So um, I, as part of, um, I remember I did a video at the beginning of 2015, a series of three videos that's still on my channel. And I thought, I wonder if I could just, you know, start doing video on the side. And because I started in video, not photography, actually. And I thought well, it would be fun to do that. So I made three videos teaching the stuff I'd learned about shooting big products. Because when I went online four or five years before that to try and find somebody to show me because I was starting out this new job, there was very little about that. There was lots of tabletop product photography stuff, but very mm. little to show you something at scale. Um, and so I made these, this series, which did quite well. You know, people... People uh, watched it and shared it around because it was filling a niche, I think. Um, but I didn't care about the video. I didn't really, I didn't really enjoy the kind of dry tutorial stuff. Mm. So I, I did what everyone does, which is just abandon the channel straight away. You make a few videos, it doesn't, doesn't really fulfill you. So you go, well, that's not what I want to do. And then, so that was January 2015 and it was April 2016, I think, May 2016 where I kind of got fed up with the photography stuff I was doing. And, and, and I, I started to not enjoy picking up my camera every day, which is a sign like that you need to either change jobs if you can, but if you can't make sure that you're doing something on the side of the day job that creatively fulfills you. So I went off to Snowdonia in Wales to go and do some landscape photography, which is something I'm not good at. I don't know how to do it, but my theory was if I, if I try an aspect of photography that I, I'm rubbish at, it's going to take me back to the beginning where it was fun and exciting to learn new things and refresh photography for me. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe I should just make a little video about that. And, um, and I, I, I filmed the thing um, and to share a bit about why I was doing it, that I was feeling photography was stagnating for me and I needed to try something I wasn't good at. 
and then just vulnerably showed images that were, to be honest, fairly crap. Uh, that, but it, but I think the story of me going and trying something new grabbed people, and it felt to me what like what I used to do when I could, because through my twenties I worked as a pastor in South Africa, so it felt to me more like what I did in the church, where I would stand up and talk about my life experiences or things that I'd learned to hopefully inspire other people to get a better handle on their lives. And something just clicked together because I could not only talk about photography, which I enjoy, but I could reclaim something where, which I actually enjoyed way more in my 20s and combine them together and then move forward with a channel. So that's kind of where it started. I find watching your, your channel and your, your videos very, um, very calming um, is the way I, w- I would put it. I, um, you, you get so many YouTubers become this world of energetic um probably also falsely energetic um people and that's that's great you, you they have their place and i have them th- those moments where i need to see that type of content mm-hmm. but you handle it in such a different way you handle it in a way that I, i'd like to think i would attempt to handle it and it's very matter of fact it's very the reasons why um i'm making this video why i'm telling you what i'm telling you and going about it so that anybody, absolutely anybody, whether they're just picking up the camera for the first time or they've had a camera in their hands for 50 years, that they can all understand and relate to it. And that is very different to how I perceive almost every other channel out there related to photography or anything creative for that matter. Right. So I, 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 do, I generally go to your channel first if I'm looking for something, I have to say. Um, before I go anywhere else, because I know I'm going to get accurate information and I'm going to get it delivered in a way that I completely relate to. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, I think the interesting thing about that also is, especially with your channel, is that it's not necessarily, um, you know, a lot of the times I watch a video and I kind of think, well, I already know how to do this. But what's really interesting here is the thought process and the thinking behind it and the philosophy behind it. And so many times have I seen things where, you know, of, of your stuff where it's really kind of given me a new perspective or it's, it's made me think. And I think that's, you know, as a creative, that's, that's, that can never be a bad thing. You know, when you start to re what's the word recalibrate what you're doing, mm-hmm. you start to look at it um, maybe with, with a different set of eyes, you know, it's um, it's, it's, I found, I found it very useful um, in the past. Cool. For sure. So, you just mentioned that you started your kind of speaking career because I, I want to talk about this a little bit because it, it, another thing that really sets your uh, your videos apart is just the way that you naturally communicate with the viewer. And mm-hmm. you've said it; it's it, that's a lot that comes that seems to be coming from yourself. So you you, you seems to you, you like what's the word? You sort of open yourself up like an open book to the viewer. That's the impression that that one gets when you know. When um when one watches that sounds very British. The impression <laughs> one gets when one watches your video. <laughs> what's what, old chap? Yeah, I saw that. Oh, it's very good. It's anyway, very good. Um, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is, um, you put a lot of yourself into into your videos, and it's it is very interesting to see you communicate with your audience. Um, is that is that something that comes from your experience of being a pastor and and addressing addressing a congregation? Yeah, I, I, but but not because that's how everyone did it. I mean, I think I I think I did it differently to most people back then as well. So, mm. I mean, the, the stereotype of most pastors, and it was definitely something I bore out and saw, was that they would they would kind of you know take a passage and then they would it's like playing the greatest hits, you know, like you're going to stand up on in front of a congregation on a Sunday, you're going to avoid the problematic chapters in the Bible, because we don't really know how to explain a lot of the genocide and shit. So let's move away from that stuff. And let's go towards, we'll play the hits. And then everyone's kind of uh, happy with that. And, and they go home feeling like they heard their favorite track. Um, mm. I didn't take that approach because I just didn't buy it. And, and, and also I felt like if I didn't talk about my doubts, as much as the things I believed, I was lying. That's how I felt. And I mm-hmm. felt like, I mean, this is it's gonna be no surprise that I got fired at the end of this career because you know <laughs> it's, it doesn't it doesn't 
that they can't they can't have someone like me there because I'm, I cause problems. Um, which wasn't which wasn't the reason I was doing it. I, I always had this idea that um, if if you take the idea of faith, even you know, it's believing things you can't see. Um, then then a lot of a lot of people in the church, for example, would say that doubt is the opposite of faith. You know, these these two opposite sides. But the, the approach I took was you can't have faith without doubt. And the example I would give would be like, imagine if you, if you believe in God and you die and then you, you see him in front of you after you die and he's standing there in front of you and talking to you. Do you need faith in God anymore? And the answer is no, of course not, because now you can see him, so you don't need it anymore. So faith only can exist when you have doubt, because the minute there's certainty, faith evaporates. You don't need it anymore. So I thought that talking about my doubts and being honest and open and vulnerable about the things I didn't really believe in this book and the things that I think we've misunderstood because we don't take cultural context into account and the rest of it, I mean, we're, we're as important. So every Monday morning, I would receive long emails from a particular group in the congregation telling me I was a heretic and I was about to get stoned in the car park for saying stuff I said because, <laughs> but I'm like, I, I, I predominantly worked with, 35 year olds and under. So young people were my, were my bracket. And I was sick of them going off to university and coming back and going, Hey, Sean, like I've grown up in the church. I'm learning all this stuff at university. It doesn't match up with what I heard in the church. Why are they lying to me? Uh, and I had to go, I'm, yeah, they have, I'm sorry. There's a lot more to the world than what they're telling you. And I was sneaking them out the back door, telling them, go and follow truth. Wherever you find it, go follow truth. Because if, if God is truth, that's where he is. And maybe he doesn't live here as much anymore. So go follow what the things you, you find out that are true and dig deep on that stuff. Um, so I've kind of taken the same approach. That's, I mean, that's how I'm wired. I am that person. I will overshare. I'll tell you everything about my life. I'm not going to hold anything back because I like people like that for myself. Those are the people who I'm friends with. Those are the people I connect with, um, open and honest people who don't feel the need to guard and sort of push their personas up front and pretend they're better than they are. I really connect mm -hmm. to honest people. So I, I can't help but be that. So when I started on my YouTube channel, that, that was automatic. That was like, if I was going to do that in the church where it cost me a career, I'll, I'm definitely going to do it here where I get to control the space and decide how I want to talk. I'm going to be honest about where photography works and where it doesn't work for me, where I've been successful and where, I, where I've fallen on my ass, where, where life has worked for me and where it's fallen apart and what I've learned as well. Because I think that's honestly how we dispel the fears we have about falling behind because we're all pretending with each other, especially on something like social media, that our lives are together. We're super successful. Everything's brilliant and glossy. We're all, we're all lying. Like actually we're all, we're all struggling in many ways. And the more honest we are with each other about that stuff, the more comforting that is, which is why I think people say stuff like you just said about my channel. And I appreciate that, that, that it feels like a comforting place to be or a calming place to be. I think it's because I'm not trying to pretend that you're falling behind me because I'm so much more successful than you are because I'm not. I'm, I'm fighting and struggling just like you are. We're all in the same boat. That feels better. And I remember when I was beginning in photography, there were so many YouTubers I watched who I got good information from and they were super mm -hmm. enthusiastic and entertaining to watch. But I felt bad because I was trying all the things that they were trying and I wasn't as successful as, as they looked, but then they disappear after a month or two because actually they didn't have these huge clients they pretended to have. And people weren't knocking on the door at all hours and they didn't have these flash fancy studios. It was just a space they rented that they couldn't afford to keep the rent up on. They were also faking it and their, their YouTube channel was self-promotion and marketing. And, and there were some, there were a few people one, one that stands out is, um, do you know Zach Arias? He's a Fuji. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fuji, well, yeah. He made a video for Scott Kelby years ago, uh, probably 2011, 2010, 2011, something like that, just called Transform, I think, where he starts out in the video. It's a great, it's still online. You should go look it up. And this was one that stuck in my head. He starts out the video doing the, 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 like, the like parody of the super enthusiastic YouTuber and like talking about the fact that he's just bought like, Ikea sticks that he put in a vase behind him to look super cool and super like trendy and all the rest of it. Now, <laughs> today he's going to talk about this camera and he's throwing lenses and stuff. And like, and suddenly he just stops and puts everything down on the desk and says something like, 
I'm, I feel like I'm traveling a thousand miles an hour down a dead end road. And then it just goes to black and it comes up with like B roll and his voiceover being very honest about the fact that he doesn't know he's going to pay the bills at the end of this month. He doesn't know Mm -hmm. if photography is actually the right choice for him. He's really struggling. And I thought that kind of honesty is what I used to do in the church and got into trouble for. If I ever, and this is five years before I started a YouTube channel, if I ever start a YouTube channel, it will be that honest at least. So that's kind of been a, 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 something I wanted to do and was kind of a guiding, a guiding principle for me. Okay. So COVID has already affected people in a horrendous way and mentally more than anything we've talked about a lot on, uh, on this podcast. Mm. What, and I'm, I'm making an assumption that this has happened to lots of other people out there is that over that, that those, the last 18 months, I've become more honest and open with my, my friends and family mm. about how I'm feeling and things like that. And historically I've been very closed it's yeah. just the way I'm, 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 I'm built, but no more. And I think that that, and we've seen a couple of videos come out on YouTube from set from, we, we don't have to mention them all right now. There's a bit of a backlash to those YouTubers, which aren't honest. Um, the, the, exact type of people you've just described described there and i think there's we're coming to a time where that's gonna have to come to a head and people like yourself who are being honest about what it's really like yeah. to do what you do yeah is going to come to the forefront because that's the reality we live in and people are i think are hopefully are becoming a bit more wise to it now yeah and because we're being more open and honest and they, they're starting to realize because they listen to people like you and they'll go well if you're like that, then how is it, how is it even possible for that person to be this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, everything's perfect. Yeah. You know, mm. I'm earning this, 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 and this. No, you're yeah. not. No, you're not. So I'm, I'm hoping that that backlash kind of continues a bit because I want to see more honesty out there because it yeah. does make you feel bad. You know, it may very well be that because there's so, such a pro- proliferation of uh, different platforms and, you know, um, and so many different, like so many more people and channels that are, that are sort of occupying our time now and, and, and the time of our children as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's gotten to the point where it's becoming more and more difficult to actually connect with somebody if everything that you're being given of somebody's personality or personal life to connect with is actually just fake. Yeah. It's very difficult. And I think as humans, we're probably, you know, instinctively going to be, you know, in tune with that. Like it's, you know, I don't think, yeah. do you know what I mean? It's like, I think it's difficult to connect with somebody if, if you sense that what's going on there isn't you know, actually true. You know, if you think way. about, think about politics in the world over the last few years as well, not that we're going to go down that route, God, <laughs> um, but it, you can, you can, there are similarities there. Oh, for sure, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that the world is now, or half the world is turning around going, that was a load of bullshit, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I tell you what, this is like, this is not, you know, I, I, I I promise this isn't going to go into like a massive rant, but I no. hate the term authentic real food. Like who came up with this? It's like, I mean, it's such a marketing ploy and it drives me nuts every time I see a van go by and it says real food. And it's like, really real food? What, as, in, as opposed to like plastic aubergines? <laughs> this makes no sense. You know, immediately it seems from the outset, it seems it seems fake, and it yeah. makes you know it, it turns me off the whole thing. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's interesting. You see, the thing I think um, <laughs> the, the thing about opening up and becoming more honest, you know, obviously, and again, we've talked about this many times on this podcast. It's you know, for us, this this is this podcast was really the catalyst for that at the very beginning of the very first lockdown when everything just stopped and you know, and we couldn't leave our houses anymore, and um, you know, and both of us felt that we needed to have some way to talk about what was going on and how we were feeling and how it was affecting us, you know, over time. And, um, and that was, that's really what lies at the, at the, at the very, um, core of, of how mm-hmm. we started the, the camera check podcast was because, you know, we, we spent hours talking about cameras and photography and whatever. Um, but, it very quickly became this thing where it gave us really a channel that we could really, you know, just be honest with each other and say like, oh, you know, it's like, I feel like the walls are caving in today because I haven't been out the house for six weeks, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. 
Jara, how did um how did that affect you? Just talking about um COVID for a minute. It's how 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 did it affect you and how difficult was it moving house during COVID? <laughs> um, uh, I mean, uh, most most of kind of lockdown and stuff was was all right. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm an introvert, so I I wasn't one of the ones who was really struggling mentally. I don't mind alone time, so that was okay. Mm. Plus, I, I this um, this publisher approached me just before we went into lockdown, so I I had a book to write through lockdown, which is a great project to have if you're stuck at home and you can't go anywhere. So I kind of had this distraction and didn't mind um, the space. I just used it to kind of plow away at this thing. Um, yeah, moving was tricky because um, I moved to a place that was being built and there were were a ton of delays, mm -hmm. which, uh, because they, you know, couldn't get bricklayers and they couldn't get bricks right. and, you know, I mean, basic stuff you need for houses. <laughs> so like... Uh, it kept getting pushed back. I had to leave my London flat at a point because I needed to give in notice. They knew I was leaving. Um, and then I was stuck in an Airbnb for a couple of months in between places waiting for them to finish it. And then when I moved in, it kind of wasn't finished. And it's just, yeah, it's been a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I, people are dealing with a lot worse than that. I, I'm, I, I can't complain too much. It's just been a lot of kind of inconvenient stuff. I've almost in my head, I think, just gone, well, this year's a write-off, you know, when you get to yeah. like two thirds of the year, you just go, well, I'll just, we'll, we'll pick things up in 2022. I'll get through this one and then we'll start rebuilding next year. But yeah, I mean, it's moving itself has been, has been a really good experience, but all the kind of details around it have been pretty challenging, you know, all the kind of logistics and stuff. Did you so, take, did you take that as an opportunity to get rid of lots of stuff? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't have a lot of stuff anyway. Uh, I probably have more stuff now than I did before I moved because I didn't own any furniture. I just, I rented sort of semi-furnished accommodation and stuff. So I, and and I pare my life down a lot. So I don't, I don't have uh, bookshelves full of books. I have photography books, but I, I read everything off a of Kindle. I don't take DVDs or anything. You know, it's all, <laughs> it's all streaming nowadays. And it's you know, you don't. Uh, I've got pictures I put on the wall a few photo books, some clothes, and then everything else was like, you know, computers and cameras and gear and stuff, which I have a reasonable amount of. And it's nice to have the space to set all that up now. Just my garage has become a little studio, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I mean, everything else, I, I needed to buy furniture from scratch here. So it was just, but it's nice to kind of keep it fairly minimal and uncluttered. I like space, you know, I don't want, I, I, if it was a choice between space and stuff, I want space. So I'll keep it quite stripped back is nice, you know. So when you went through the whole um, Rick morale of, of moving and all that kind of stuff, and, and you still had a book to write, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm. um, did, that, did that turn out to be problematic to actually get your head in the right frame of mind to, to uh, um, put a book together and having to deal with everything else that was going on at the time? No, I was, I was lucky with that because I started writing properly probably in June last year. And uh, I finished it mid-January this year. So it was kind of done before everything kicked off. So m my wife left in end of January. Um, she literally just went to work one day, sent a text and said, I'm not coming home. I don't want to talk about it. And that was it. So and if she'd done that like a month or six weeks before when I had to finish the book, I think I would have been a bit of a mess and not being able to finish it. Because when you, when you need to generate thoughts and ideas and all you can think about is this terrible thing that's just come out of nowhere yeah. at you, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been able to do that. But thankfully, the only stuff I had to do in February and March was, you know, I shut stuff down on social media for a while and took a good break to kind of grieve and cry this stuff out and work out how to move forwards. And all I needed to do with the book was editing stuff. So at that stage, the book goes off to uh, proofreaders and copy editors who go through and sort of give you notes on things to change. And it becomes a more technical exercise, which I can focus on that because I'm not generating new ideas. I'm tidying up. Um, so that was, that was it, the timing on it was fairly good. And then by the time that was finished, mostly I moved up here April 10th to an Airbnb here for a couple of months and then here. So all that stuff was done before I moved as well. So everything was kind of out of my hands at the right times uh, in some way. So there's like little little things to be grateful for amidst a, a path of shit. It's like <laughs> at, least, at least kind of 
you know, that kind of, that those things kind of happen as, as well as they could have under the circumstances, I think, the timing. I guess, did, did that help you actually um, take your mind off of things as well at the time? Um, not really. I mean, when something when something like that happens, you're not going to run away from it. It just is. It is what it is, and you 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 kind of need to face it. What what I did do well, after I moved to York, because um, I was in the city of York itself in an Airbnb for a couple of months, um, and that was the first time. You know, after after I made a video about it actually and talked about liminal space, which is this idea of being stuck in between two things, stuck between the old and the new. So the old is gone, but the new hasn't yet arrived. So in so many ways, I was sitting in a in a in a in an Airbnb that wasn't my house, that I didn't really have a home. I was surrounded by boxes that I couldn't open because why would you unpack in a place that's not yours? Mm. For two months, um, you know, my old my old relationship had collapsed. Um, there's no new relationship there. There's no new partner helping you through this. Um, I'd left behind friends. Hadn't really made new friends in the new place I'd gone to yet. Um, I was in between so many old and new things that, but that I'd read in so many different places, actually, because I read a lot of sort of different philosophies and spiritualities. I find it interesting. The commonalities between all of them just seem to be the ways that human beings intuit the same stuff without having to compare notes, which to me suggests it's true. And so many spiritualities say that the time we learn and grow the most as human beings is in that liminal space, in the in-between space. Because when life's working for us, we don't really have to question very much or build very much. We can kind of sit on autopilot. But when it's all fallen apart, before the new, before the new status quo arrives, you've got a lot of thinking and processing to do. So I got really deliberate about taking daily walks for an hour a day just to go. And, you know, I might take photographs as well on the way. I might not. But the point was just to get out because I find for me that walking is the, the way that I process and think the best. Um, so I did that a lot. And sometimes that was, you know, grieving what I'd lost. And sometimes that was thinking about what I never want to have happen again and how I can prevent that. And some of that was thinking about, well, what do I want for the future? What can I make sure I build into a future going forward in all the different ways that I'd lost old things and was moving toward new things. So hmm. I just tried to use a bad situation well. Um, I'm still trying to do that. And I did practical stuff as well. Like um, I, I signed up with a, with a therapist and started going to weekly therapy sessions. It's not that I felt like I was, I was in any danger of falling apart like, or, or, or harming myself or mental illness or anything like that. I just think it's really healthy to go and talk to somebody about things that you're going through, even if you think you have a handle on it. And you know, I, I might think, well, no, I've kind of got this handle. It's still a massive life thing to happen to you. And it's probably best to, to not just assume you have that stuff handled, but to go and sit and talk through somebody who's going to be objective with you and tell you actually if, if you are, if you do have it handled. Because it's really dangerous at times like that where you can think you've got it all together and suddenly it's not. Suddenly it falls apart because you've assumed it's fine, but you can get into a fog of confusion that doesn't feel like confusion. And it's really healthy, I think for anybody in any of those difficult situations, just go talk to somebody. It's, it's not a hard thing to do. Um, and you know, you might feel like it's, it's not worthwhile, but the more you do it, you know, I've been going for like, I'm still going now just cause you know, there's more stuff to talk about. I found out and that's, that's always good. And I'm, I'm learning new things about myself in my early forties. That's, that's not a bad thing. That means I didn't know things about myself and good. I am now, you know, and, and how not to repeat those mistakes going forward. It's, it's all good stuff, you know? Man, I wish uh, I wish I'd done things in the way that you you've kind of handled them. Uh, I went for a similar experience. I got divorced you know, a few years ago, right. and you know it was horrendous. There's yeah. really not any other word for it. To the yeah. point where I my house was the house we lived in was due to be sold um, in a week's time like, to complete, and I hadn't found anywhere else to live yet. Yeah. So do you know what I mean? I was that yeah. kind of bad if you like you know I was kind of hiding it all away and no one really knew that that was going on because I wasn't I didn't share things in a way that I I can talk about them today yeah and it was actually my mother who realized what was going on took pity on me and said I'm gonna take care of this for you yeah and she found me somewhere to live that day wow and I, I, I moved in and and that was great you know it was fine for for a week and you know it's it's interesting you say that's 
you, all those boxes sat around you is, it can really mess with your head that. Yeah. And so I, I let them sit there for a while. And, and one, one morning I woke up and said, I can't do this anymore. Like it's, yeah. And I unpacked everything in the house and got it all in some kind of order. Yeah. Cause I do better when things are in order and things aren't, there isn't change happening. Mm -hmm. So that that's it. That's moved. That's there. Great. And I just immediately felt on the surface at least, but I felt better. Mm -hmm. I felt better, but you know, I'm, admire the way that you you've you've handled um handled the whole situation and i wish i'd had the i don't know balls if you like to go to therapy at the time um you know i've spoken to a psychiatrist a couple of times in um recent years and even just those couple of sessions really really helped yeah. and that was a, I, I used to work for amazon and um yeah in corporate and that was right at the end of it, you know, and he said, you, you need some time off from this place because mm. this in conjunction with you not dealing with previous issues mm. is what's taking you down right at the moment. And you, if this is one thing you can control right at the minute, it's your work, control it, and you need some time off from it. So I did. I took a, a month out. And when I went back, I handed in my notice. Mm. It was a massive factor to how unhappy I was at the time. And I immediately felt better because I'd controlled that situation. Yeah. And yeah. that, that in the, you know, cut a very, very long story short is that's when I started to go self-employed. I started mm -hmm. um, moving into um, filmmaking and, and photography and none of this would have ever happened for me yeah. if I hadn't taken that time out to talk to someone and reevaluate where I was at that moment. And if anybody's out there feels that they think, mm, maybe I should have talked to a therapist, it's like, just go do it. Just even if you go for one session, it's, it's not, going to be beneficial. It's not scary, beneficial. is it? I mean, you, when, when no. you go, you realize they're not there to give you answers. They're there to be an objective mirror that you talk yep. at. If you go in to, because you want them to tell you what to do next, they won't. They're not supposed to. They're supposed to just sit and listen and, and ask you questions to get you talking to yourself, really, to go like, hang on a minute, but does that mean what I think? And then challenging your assumptions when you make assumptions. Again, no, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't line up. Do you think... What about this? And the more you do that, because sometimes you can't trust your mates to do that. Like, like your mates yeah. are there for you and, 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 but they might just be being supportive. You know, I mean, it doesn't help. It doesn't help you if someone goes to you, yeah, you're better off without that woman. Like she was awful to you, blah, blah. It doesn't help. That's what they want to no. do because they want to be supportive, but you need someone to go, well, that is what it is. You can't change other people, but what about you? What mistakes are you making in the way that you're, you're partnering up with people or whatever. You can't do that with mates necessarily. And you need someone who's going to, who, it doesn't cost them anything to be honest with you. And then yeah. they're not going to lose a relationship with you because they don't care. They'll just tell you. And that's invaluable. And facing that stuff, I find that, because I've learned in my life, anytime I've tried to not deal with something when it's happening, it will definitely come back and bite me in the ass later and it will be worse. Yep. And I've got stuff I want to do in my life. So I don't want to keep suppressing things or pushing them down because I might be on a roll with something two years from now and this thing comes up and completely sabotages and ruins something good that's happening. So as things happen, I want to face them as bravely as I can and, 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 and knock them out as they raise their heads because being brave in the moment is going to save me a ton of time down the road. I think. Yeah. A ton of time and a ton of heartache and yeah. problems and, oh, yeah, um, it's it's very difficult with you. with friends sometimes because it's you know very often the focus um is on the other person. It's like you said, and you're like, well, you know, she's a bitch and blah blah and this yeah. and the other. And and really, um, it takes a very special friend to turn around to you and say, like, okay, so what about you? You know, how yeah. are you feeling? Like, what's yeah. what's going on in your head? And yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> I think I mean we've you know we've been in similar situations. I guess you know for me it was, um, I. It took me a year. I made the mistake of not not seeing a therapist at the time, and you know, it took me a year to get through it. And um, I, it was when I realized that I was sort of borderline depressive. Mm. I think I, I could see the symptoms of depression knocking on the door, and uh, that was the moment when I had to draw a line. And I basically realized that I had to make drastic changes, and that changed my whole life. I was, yeah. you know, I was, I mean, we talked about this before. We were, you know, I used to run a music school. Um, and I sold the whole shebang for one pound um, mm. because I decided on a Friday that I needed to get that weight off my shoulders. Mm. And by Monday, that was gone. And it, 
it had to be that radical and uh, I had to make dramatic changes. And see, that's, that's a really good word, radical. And that's because, mm. you know, there are different situations, but similar in many respects, that because sure. we hadn't dealt with it to begin with, huh. it built up to such a point that we had to take such radical action yeah, to try absolutely. and get ourselves out of it, right? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it was just, you know, it's a similar sort of thing to Nick, really. You know, in my, in my case, it was, um, it was actually also my mum who basically realized that because I, you know, I'm, I'm like a third generation photographer, if you want. And, uh, but I had been a musician up to that point, um, just because, you know, I've always, well, I've always considered myself to be a creative because I just like making things. Um, so just like you I actually started with a video and I used to mm -hmm. make videos when I was a kid and then, you know, I had a career in music. Um, and my mom, what, you know, when I was like at the, at the bottom, um, and I realized I had to kind of take a 180 degree round, you know, turn in my life, she goes like, how about photography? You've always liked imagery and making visuals and stuff like that. You know, how mm. about photography? And I, you know, and she bought me a camera. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, this sounds like a good idea. Let's try that out. And I realized actually, you know, the first time I picked this thing up, it was, it was just immediate. I, I knew I was going to get totally addicted to it. Mm. And that's, mm. you know, that was a long time ago now. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's worked out. But, um, I, th I mean, just like, I think the problem with what, with where we're at, like as human beings is like, we, we, we used to be a lot more communal, you know, families, extended families yeah. used to live together. Village life was more of a thing. Everyone knew everyone and mm -hmm. checked up on everyone and cared about everyone. The more we've gone into kind of our modern era, the more separate we are from each other. We've got this kind of hyper drive for individualism. And it's all about mm -hmm. me and my individual feelings and my success versus everybody else. We lock each other into our, we lock ourselves into our homes and we, we, we deal with each other online. We're so separate and closed off that I reckon now this pendulum swing is coming where people are suddenly realizing, and what's that? I can't remember where the quote comes from, but it's something like, you're only as sick as your secrets. The more you bottle that stuff in, that's the stuff that makes you sick. That's the stuff that leads to stress and breakdowns and you can't cope and you're not really sure what's going on. And I think is a big reason for the prevalence of stuff like anxiety in our culture is the stuff we keep to ourselves that we don't, we don't share with each other. It's, it's a big reason why I am as honest as I am with what's going on in my life. Cause I need to do that. And I know that I'm not doing it as a gift for somebody else. I'm doing it as a gift for me because I've worked out that when I share difficult things, the terrible thing I was afraid that would happen doesn't really happen. And I feel much better, in which case it's a win-win. So, so just do it and do it more. Like my mom's generation doesn't get it. Like mm. she, she thinks she cringes to hear the stuff I share with the internet at large and strangers online. She thinks it's awful, but, but, but like she struggles. And I keep saying to her, maybe that's the reason. Maybe, maybe you need to talk to people more. Maybe you need to share more about what's going on in your life and open up because that stuff I mean, I really think it, it, it leads to physical issues down the road as well. Like it, we bottle that stuff up, it'll, it will really sabotage us. I, I can guarantee you it does. I, I've always had issues with my back and things like that, right, for about you know, 15 years or more now. And I know that if I'm stressed or I'm going through an issue and I'm not dealing with it, I have the worst back pain mm -hmm. when I don't get me wrong when i am happy and i'm you know i've got everything out of out of me or i believe i've got everything out of me i still have back pain but it's so so much worse because mm. it just all goes into my you know muscles and into my spine and all yeah. there and it just sits there yeah. digging at me and digging at me until i do something about it oh man i can relate it it, it manifests physically. and i get ill you know i get yeah. colds i get things like that and run down and all of that stuff but I mean, even with anxiety, I mean, anxiety is a real thing, but I think it's, I think we bring it on ourselves with our society because, I mean, I grew up in Africa, mostly um, in like uh, countries like Zimbabwe, Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini, South Africa. Like you, you go to, you go to rural African villages that are just a circle of huts in the middle of nowhere and start mm. interviewing people and go like, hey guys, are you really struggling with anxiety here? I think they don't know what you're talking about because they're just <laughs> life simpler. Like they're taking care of each other. Yeah. There's proper community, proper sharing of life with each other. It's us who close ourselves off and, and, and board up the windows and doors and think we can deal with everything on our own. We're the sick ones and we're making ourselves sick by living like that. And there are ways we can all break that stuff down. 
by sharing yeah. that, you know. You know what I love about this podcast? It's therapy for us as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it started as therapy for us. Yeah, it is. Really. So, you know, just <laughs> carrying it on, you know, <laughs> for sure. Um, so I just want to come back to, um, to your book. It's called The Meaning um, in the Making. And it's, um, I've ordered my copy, by the way. Just waiting for the, oh, cheers, thank you. Yeah, the yeah, hard yeah. copy. You know, hopefully it's there soon. Yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't got Come on myself, Amazon. <laughs> well, I haven't got myself to to uh, to own a Kindle just yet. No. Um. So I'm, I'm happy to hang on for the uh, for the hard copy. What but decade are you in, man? I, I'm permanently in the seventies, as you well know. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Um, but you know, when when I when I um, first heard about um, your book, uh, what really interested me was um, was that you really going in depth about the process of, of making something, mm -hmm. the creative process as such. Mm. And um, that's, that, that really interests me personally because I've always said this, is that you know, my interest has always been in, like, in the making of something. So no matter whether that was you know, when I used to make videos when I was a kid or, or, um, or in music, it's the creative process that's always interested me, which is why I'm I'm ex I'm an, I'm an ex I've always been an extremely bad kind of covers band musician, mm -hmm. um, because I I just can't stand playing the same stuff over and over again. Uh -huh. What interests me is the creative process, the writing, you know, the writing process, the recording process, and then once that's completed, I'm already looking at the next thing. Like, what's mm -hmm. the next thing I can make? And um and so you don't really find a lot of books talking about that particular part. And so, um, what interests me is like, what was your, what was your process in like, you know, and first of all, deciding that that's what you wanted to write a book about. It, it came out of, um, I mean, I remember when I started to sketch out the details for the book, I was, it was my 40th birthday actually. And I, I was, um, I was in a cabin in Iceland on my own and <laughs> that's, that's where I was on. And it was raining hard, turned into snow out the window. And I just, I, I was doing thinking about, um, I was doing thinking about my journey so far, like the, the fact that I was with the church and I, I did write a book at the end of my time with the church as well that I self-published back in South Africa. Um, that's kind of put that to bed and, you know, why I wasn't going back to the church again. Um, and then I thought, well, what have I done in the 10 years since that? Because I was 30 when I just, when I self-published that, but what have I done in this last decade? And what's the important stuff that I'm talking about now. And I realized that there's the stuff I care about on my YouTube channel is that philosophical playlist. There's different playlists on my channel, some tutorial stuff and street photography, portrait photography, featured photographers. And there's this philosophical playlist that's just me sitting on a couch talking usually. And the, the, the messages I love to get from people are, and there are a lot of people like this who say, I follow your channel, but I'm not a photographer. Um, I'm, I'm a painter or I'm a dancer or I'm an actor, but I find that playlist is really helpful because it applies to anyone who makes anything. And I thought that's probably what I feel like I have to say, because I don't want to repeat what I'm already doing. I want to take something that I'm doing as a part of that channel and expand on it hugely and really try and put down everything I think about the creative process that applies to anyone who makes anything. And so I started to just sketch out a rough outline of where I take this thing and where I'd weave in my own journey in the story. Cause I didn't want it to just be a dry book of concepts. I wanted to tell my story with this stuff as well. So it was, it was back then. And then it just sat in the back of my head really until, until March last year, when this publisher came to me and said, Hey, do you want to do a book with us? And I mean, in their heads, they're probably, you know, going, well, this is, this is a guy who's got an audience, so it's some guaranteed sales. The, the book that I wanted to do didn't really fit in with the kind of books they were doing, which were more, um, more very specifically photography tutorial sort of books. Or, but they were starting to branch out a bit. And they said, well, this would be an interesting book for us to do because it's a new thing for us as well. And I thought, well, you know, it works for me. Hopefully it gets a bit more distribution out there and gets the book outside of my audience. So let's give it a crack. And then lockdown hit which gave me this perfect window of time with no excuses to sit down at a computer for a few hours a day and just try and hammer this thing out. So that's kind of where it started. I feel like had they approached you for to, to do this book and you came back with, this is my idea of what I would like to do, and they weren't ready for that, 
I still feel like you would have gone ahead and written it anyway, even if they weren't interested in that particular concept at that moment. Do you think, is that, would that be fair, fair to oh, say? Oh yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd said that to them. We had a discussion early on and they said they, they, they made some suggestions about um, ways I could tweak the book to make it more like what they do. And I said, I'm just not interested. Mm-hmm. And what I said to them was, look, e- either I do it this way or I do it myself and I'm fine to do it myself. I mean, I, I self-publish a book of my own photography at the beginning of every year. I know all the processes are in place. I could just do it. Um, but to their credit, they said, no, okay, well, you know, this, this will be new for us, but we're, 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 we're keen to try it. So that's mm. kind of how we got here. But yeah, absolutely. I would have, I would have done it either way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, especially during you, lockdown. You mentioned earlier you, you're about to do an audio book um, as well. Is that an audio version of your book or something separate? No, yeah. Well, it's it's. Uh, so many people have been asking for it that I, I'm now kind of looking at uh, potentially sitting down and cracking it out. So at the moment, I'm just testing to see if I can just do it from home with the, with yeah. the gear that I've got or just just bought. Um, I think I need to read it myself just because. Okay. Uh, I think that's what people are asking for anyway, as they're used to hearing me talk about stuff in videos, having my voice to it probably makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it'll just be a case of finding a good, a good chunk of time to actually it sit and hammer this thing out time, in the next it? few months. But yeah, it's, it's on the cards. I'm just trying to work out how to do it well. Oh no, that's awesome. I mean, you, you've got a cracking narrator style voice that would go really, really well with it. And <laughs> you know, that adds to your, your channel in general is the, it's the way you present what it is you're talking and it makes a huge difference. If I went ahead and read your book out as, as the voice on your audio book, it wouldn't have nearly the same impact, I don't think. Unless you can get Robert De Niro to read it for you. That's Robert De Niro. True. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Although there's it. always, there's always something about hearing authors read their own books, I think, because you yeah. can hear what they mean in the way that they, they stress different words in different sentences. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that was, that wasn't a creative choice from a third party. That was because they meant that that way, which is kind of, I like that when people do that. Absolutely. That's why I listen to the Alan Partridge audiobooks. Because you've got to have that voice doing it. <laughs> oh, I thought, I thought you were going to say because Rob De Niro. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Robert De Niro reads Alan Partridge. I don't yeah, know. Well, that's something I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> or hear. Awesome. Yeah. You know, the thing, the thing that always freaks me out about uh, audiobooks is when you hear the same voice on like different books. That's a little bit like, you know, where I grew up in, in the south of Germany where movies are dubbed. Mm-hmm. And so, right. so sometimes you have different <laughs> actors, but with the same voice, that's weird. That's really weird. I mean, they're quite good at doing this um, because like, let's say, you know, well-known actors, like let's say Robert De Niro, he will always have the same voice in every movie. So they use the same voice actor for oh. that particular actor. So it's, you sort of then start to associate the voice with, yeah. with this particular, um, you know, actor, but. Of course, that's not the only voice they're doing. So Robert De Niro's voice might also be somebody else's voice. And that's always, that's odd. <laughs> that's I've, odd. You know? I want to see you doing Rob De Niro's voice on, uh, on the dubbed, dubbed films. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could do. Yeah. yeah next week's challenge. <clears throat> it's not, I mean, I remember like as a kid, I, I used to, there's a thing um, well, like in Poland, they also dub, but they dub differently. In Poland, they have the same voice speaking all the characters in a TV show or in, in the movie. <laughs> so it's like usually you have this like really this this like low like male voice, and that'd be the same. You know, it'd be a conversation between you know a guy and a girl, and be like, ooh, blah 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 blah, and then the girl be, ooh, how does what I do? Doesn't work at all. Really? Yeah. <laughs> must be so confusing. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's totally weird. I have absolutely no idea why they're dubbing things, but you ask any, like whenever I have this conversation with my cousins or any of my relatives, and I'll be like, how can you like, I, I'm so like, I just, it freaks me out when I watch a dub movie. And they're like, how can you not watch a dub movie? It's crazy to not watch it dubbed. And it's like, <laughs> okay. I think I'd rather watch the subtitles or re- read the subtitles. Me too. Even. Me too. Mm. But you know, like my cousins, it's funny because they would not accept subtitles under any circumstances. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? Interesting. It's, you know, it's weird, but it's just, I guess it's what you're used to and how, yeah. you know, what you grew up with. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I was only, I was used to like watching dub stuff. Yeah. Kirsten De Niro over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, cool. So your book, let's come back to your book. Yeah. After this is <laughs> We digress. <laughs> um, so uh, the meaning in the making is, oh, it's obviously it's available, um, 
to it's available to download at the moment as a Kindle version, and the hard the, um, the the hard copy will be available in the UK within the next few weeks. Is that right? Yeah, they're here. They're in the warehouse. I think it's just a case now of Amazon getting them into their distribution centers and the rest of it. But yeah, it's, it's, it, wherever you are in the world, it's slightly different. It's all, they're, they're trickling mm. through. It just takes time. So uh, I think the US Amazon orders have already gone out. The physical ones are already arriving. Uh, UK, uh, they're here, but they'll probably only go out the end of the month, end of, end of August, beginning of September. Uh, yeah, Kindle versions are available to download everywhere. You can also do it through you know, Waterstones, WH Smith's are stock in them, like Barnes and Noble. Mm. There's, you can kind of go through your traditional book depository. I think it's a big one for, mm -hmm. for Germany. They like that one. Um, I've Maybe. heard there's a, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different avenues or you can just get it direct from Rocky Nook or the publisher. Plans for um, follow-up book at some point in the future, something oh, you'd gosh, like to man. do. <laughs> uh, no, not right now. No. I mean, I, I feel like, I mean, I don't, funny enough, like I, I do enjoy writing and I suppose I am technically an author, but it's not my primary thing I do. And so mm -hmm. um, I feel like I have to do a lot of, because, because I do a lot of other stuff as well, I have to do a lot of living in between writing a book. So I've got new things to say or new, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, I wrote that book in, and published it, self-published it in South Africa when I was 30, but I had to live for 10 years before I had something new to say. Um, and I yeah. feel like I might have to live for another 10 before I've got something new to talk about again. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in a year I'll just have something burning I've got to put out there, but it's definitely not in my head at the moment. Right now, <laughs> I I'm think just I disagree. Uh, in like PTSD from this last round of <laughs> publishing. <so. laughs> there's, there's, a, there's definitely a gap in the market for how to shoot sofas. Oh, I can yeah, see that. True. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I think I'll, too many I'll of those, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny when you met, when you mentioned that because one one of the one of the little jobs that um that came my way somehow uh, during lockdown was uh, I did some retouching for a um, for a furniture company uh, predominantly armchairs mm -hmm. and upholstery. Yes, it was beautiful. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent times. Just you know things we do for money. <laughs> That's yeah. all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. You know. Did you change the color of the armchair? Slightly, mm. slightly, yeah. To but match it, the decor in the room that they put it in. Uh, it's mainly it's mainly background extraction and like mm -hmm. you know tidying up shadows and creases and and you're making it more vibrant. They're all like they were all armchairs for like elderly people. Right. So I mean the color scheme was basically beige, beige, beige <laughs> dark gray, mm. bit more grayish, mm. <laughs> beige and grayish. So yeah, that's kind Muted of where we're heading with that. Nothing I know, it's exciting. Yeah. exciting. Couldn't stop myself. I was yeah. going to add some floral patterns, but yeah, it wouldn't have gone down too well or anything. No. <laughs> Sorry, my, my cat's visiting right now. Yeah, we're not alone in this room. There are cats. <laughs> well, she's quite happy. <laughs> Getting fed up of you not talking to them. <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty you, may, much. you may have seen her sort of pass yeah, yeah. through. Has she been, has she? Okay, yeah. good. Good. So obviously... The last, you know, 18 months in particular has been challenging and, you know, transitional for you. Um, what do you see the next sort of 12 to 24 months sort of looking like for you? What's, what, what's next for you? I don't know, actually. It's very hard to predict right now. And like being very honest, I've seen my YouTube channel slow its growth a lot. Like it's really plateaued over the last year. So you know, maybe I found my audience there and that's the people who will find mm -hmm. it and maybe it'll just keep trickling along. But I, I know a lot of other people are experiencing the same sort of thing at the moment. So I don't put a lot of stock in, in YouTube going forward as like, sure. it's not, it's not a sky's the limit kind of thing. I'm already seeing the limit of it. So I, I, I'm trying to work out how to expand things in, in new ways. I mean, I, I feel like, and I'm sure a lot of people feel this way that, that we need new platforms. We need new creative outlets online that give us a bit more control and are less dictatorial. And they all start out offering the world and then slowly clamp things down and right. control and, and feed ads and are less, less supportive of creators. So it'd be nice to see something new emerge. I mean, Instagram is the same for me. I mean, you know, I have a, a, a very nice size following on there, but it's also ground to a halt in terms of growth. Um, so, and I think everyone's kind of a bit bored of that kind of thing. So I'm looking for what to do next. And, and I, I've always, I've always really had that 
um, Thousand True Fans philosophy. I don't know if you've come across Kevin Kelly's article, Thousand mm. True Fans, that it's really not about that big number of followers you have because most of them forgot about you a long time ago and they're not really there anymore. It's about that core who really care about what you do and are supportive of you and interested in what you're doing. It's, it's, it's working out better ways to serve them. So that might be YouTube for a while, but I'm on the lookout for something new. It might be Instagram for now. It's a nice way to communicate, but there's got to be something else. The book is definitely a step going forwards into a new direction, hopefully, where I can talk more about creativity in general. I'll still be feeding out photography tutorials and, and because I can teach that stuff and I enjoy teaching and I like helping people with that stuff. But I, there's more important things I want to expand into talking about in the long term. Um, how that gets um, monetized and like supports me and pays the bills, I don't really know. It works for now with what I'm doing with a mix of, of YouTube, although I, I don't trust it, um, and self-publishing a book of photography every year. Um, to that core audience. Like I can keep things going that way for now. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I feel like, I feel like there's a shift that needs to happen. I'm just not sure how to make that move or, or really what it looks like yet. Um, so I'm all, I've more got a sense that things need to change, um, but no real answers. And it kind of, it kind of lines up with everything else in my life at the moment as well, because I'm moving to a new part of the world. Um, I kind of leave, I kind of leave this trail of great friends across the world as I move on to new places um, who are still there. And, you know, we, we still keep in conversation, but they're not in my daily life the way that they were when I was living in those places. So, you know, it's again, it's making new relationships in this new part of the world. It's, it's getting into the, 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 the culture of this part of the world, which is different to other places I've lived. And that's good. It's, it's, finding new hobbies here and getting involved in new photography projects. I'm, I've started on a, hopefully a longer term photography project that's more documentary in nature. So that's exciting. That might mm. in the long term lead to a book and maybe an exhibition, but I'm very early days. I haven't taken a single photograph yet. I'm literally just, you know, I've, I've pulled together a, a, a plan for it and mood boarded it. And I'm starting to talk to people and meet people in the area who can help me do it. And and potential subjects and very early doors, but that's, that's the next kind of long-term project I'm excited about. Um, yeah. And it's just one, one step in front of the other for a while and see which things stick and which things don't. Cause my, my propensity is I, I I'm a control freak. I want to control everything. I want to, and I only want to do things that I know will be brilliant and will definitely work out because I'm a perfectionist, but you know, growing up means just try little things as, and as they go, you know, yeah. plan it well, try execute it well. And then, the things that don't work quite as well, let them fall apart and put something new in its place and just keep moving one thing at a time is what I'm slowly learning. Yeah. Well, it's also a learning experience, of course. You know, you have to expose yourself to different things sometimes because even, you know, even if it doesn't necessarily work out, there are always takeaways from that in, in the end. And it mm -hmm. ultimately makes you a better photographer and a better creative, actually, just by experiencing those setbacks, you know. Yeah. I've always thought that, um, you know, sometimes when something doesn't work out is actually much more valuable than the things that do work out in the end because you know because you can take so many things away from that mm -hmm. you, you know for the years and years and years i didn't believe in that and the reason mm -hmm. i didn't believe in it is because much like yourself i'm a bit of a perfectionist and i will only take on things i know that i'm i'm good at mm -hmm. and it took me <clears throat> the longest time to realize well how can i really know what i'm good at if i haven't actually tried this, 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 and this. I can't. And how can I know? Yeah. I can't know. See, the thing is, like, and I it, might fail. Yeah. And that first couple of failures was, God, they, they kicked my ass. See, the mm -hmm. thing is, like, this is this is where when Nick and me are really different when we approach projects, for example. Um, and and I think that's sort of it's, um, th this is exactly the basis for that. Is that is that, you know, Nick's very organized and he's very like, okay, you know, pre planning is like very big, and and I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm like. I'm gung ho. I go in all guns blazing and I fail. I will fail, but this is how I learn. And I'm reveling in the failure because I know I'm going to come out having learned a whole bunch of things. And even if it's just, well, okay, I'm not going to do that again, you know, but um, this is like the difference between us, I think, you know, sometimes, mm -hmm. um, and it's been good for us, you know, uh, working together over the last couple of years or something. It's because it's pulled us both into each other's directions a little bit. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. I I've learned the, the value of pre-planning for sure. 
Um, and I think for you, it's, it's probably been sort of the opposite. It's like letting go sometimes. Yeah, or, don't, you don't need to pre-plan so much. And if the plan needs to go awry or go in a different direction, hey, it's what it needs to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and then and then we just you know, I used to do this thing when um, for for a few years when I used to go out um, playing solo acoustic guitar shows, which is basically just me playing acoustic guitar. I don't sing. It was instrumental guitar music, and I never really thought that anybody would even. I mean, you know, like who listens to that stuff? I don't even listen to acoustic guitar music. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why would anybody come and see my shows? I don't know. Um, but, you know, the, the one thing I would always do after every time, I used to, I used to play, I don't know, 250 shows a year or something like that. Wow. Um, but I used to go after every show, I used to go, I used to go back either to the hotel or, you know, back home. And I'd be like, I would deconstruct that performance. And I'd basically go like, okay, well, this was pants. Let's not do that again. And, you know, I used to have very loose arrangements. I, um, for the most part, I would have, but my um, pieces weren't necessarily arranged. I'd have different parts of them, but I'd make it up on the spot. Yeah. So, you know, one night, if things were going really well with this particular piece, this could turn into a nine minute piece, yeah. you know, and another night, things were not going well, it'd be like over in 45 seconds, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but uh, it would, you know, you'd, b- because, I found that by just deconstructing things afterwards, um, it would give me the flexibility in the moment to literally be in the moment and actually just, you know, uh, be literally be creative in the moment, you know, with, with the music I was playing. Mm. Um, There's a very particular section in the book that you'll really like. All right. (laughs) Because it's exactly how we used to work as a band as well. Right. Was we used to have all the pieces of every song. Yes. um, In place. And we knew how to move and transition between them. And we even had relative major and minor versions of songs. Mm-hmm. Depending on what the crowd was like, we could switch. And I had a series of hand signals to say which section we were moving between. Mm-hmm. And there was almost like a bit of a telepathy that developed where you could just, we all knew which way we were going, but it wasn't the yeah. same as last night and it wouldn't be the same as the next night. It was always, you could kind of feel that stuff out in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you, get, you get that chemistry when you're working particularly with the same group of people. Um, for an extended period of time, yeah, sure. you know, I'm, I'm a musician as well, and I, you know, I play bass in a function band. And mm. when I'm when I've been with a um, a particular drummer for you know a year or more, or I know them personally, mm-hmm. that's key as well. Knowing that person personally, not just how they drum. Mm. I don't need to think about what's going to happen. Yeah. He doesn't need to think about what's going to happen, no matter what the structure of the song's going to end up being you just know exactly what that person's going to, or they hit something in just a certain way, you know, precisely what the next two bars is going to be. Yeah. And you follow along and it's just, mm. it's intuitive. It's yeah. absolutely intuitive. I love that. It's the yeah. greatest thing about doing the kind of thing that we do. It's, I like the risk taking in it because it's literally like you're yeah. walking this, you know, this fine line between success and failure. Like that's the thrill, yeah. you know, for me. Um, but also, it also means that you can't be afraid of, of failing because, you know, mm-hmm. guaranteed out of the hour set or, or hour and a half set that you play that night, some things will go really well, some things will be disastrous. And, you know, with that, you just have a laugh about it and move on, you know, and that's that's the thing. Uh, plus, the what, one thing that, that really struck me when I, was, when I was doing that, where I wasn't part of a band and it was just literally only me on stage, was the, the fact that you have to deal with, you know, I had to deal with like hacklers and like, you know... And you have to learn how to do that. It's, I'd you know, heckle you. No, for sure. I could heckle all the time. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, I had no idea. Like, I, I didn't know how to deal with that at all. It's hard. And, of course, you get you get used to it. You know? and, and you stop caring. In the beginning, every time, you know, somebody yeah. shouts something that, uh, you know, you you take it too personal and it's it's difficult. Yeah. But you know. Unless you truly were shocking for whatever reason. That, that, I was talking that, many a good times. Fit. It's a good sign that they're heckling. I was talking many times. I mean, you know, but, of course, the thing is, like, you know, it's like shocking by whose standard. Like sometimes I would, I would play something exactly. and I would be so distraught about the version of this track that I just played. And yet, you know, after the show, you'd have like X amount of people come up to you, you know, congratulating you on 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 this particular tune. You go, man, this up, this was the t- 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 complete train wreck. You know, mm-hmm. so it's it's like, but you know, by whose standard is the uh, my I mean, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's completely impossible to be objective. I was there in the first place. <laughs> Did a gig a couple of weeks ago, and I ended up I ended up playing this. This well, it was "Fix You" by Coldplay, right? Of all the songs, that, oh, okay. I hate Coldplay. Anyway, 
And there's the turnaround at the end, right? And I was, I was playing C sharp rather than C for two of the turnarounds right. because I couldn't hear over the subs. I had in-ears in, but I couldn't quite distinguish between C and C sharp oh, so you, did it, you did it for two turnarounds? I did it for two well, turnarounds. Well, that's okay because, you know, as they say, if you play the wrong note, play it again and pretend it's jazz. Precisely. <laughs> and I, I, was, I was kicking myself for the rest of that song and the rest of that set. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I'd done that. I was so annoyed at myself. No, no one else heard it. No, of course not. No one else cared. Only me. Yeah. I won't do it again, but no one cares. It doesn't matter. No. It, it makes it slightly more interesting. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> jazz. Anyway. <laughs> it's jazz. jazz. That's right. I play in the, the key of chromatic. Yes. Well, you know, on the guitar, it's, it's, it's easy because, you know, you, when you play jazz, you're always one fret away from playing the right note. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway yes. there we are like bringing it back to photography right now <laughs> um so are you now that you're um up in yorkshire um are, are you are you looking at sort of improving your landscape photography is that something you you're interested in generally or because you mentioned uh, it earlier a little bit um, yeah i mean i'm not not i don't think i'll be a landscape photographer i'm not i'm not taking backpacks of gear and tripods up mountains like I, but i've got my little my little rico gr camera that sits in my pocket which i do run around and i take photos in the forest or villages or mm. farmlands and stuff i mean it's not traditional landscape photography at all I, I don't really want to deep dive it but i'll i'll shoot landscapes um mm. it's the same as street really i don't consider myself a street photographer you know i i shoot on the street but i don't i don't I don't shoot reportage of human interactions in candid settings. That's not what, what I'm interested in. It's more how light and shadow interact in space in urban settings. So now all I'm doing is switching that obsession to more rural settings. And it's, is that landscape photography? Maybe some would call it that. I don't really need to kind of box it though. I'm just going to keep shooting kind of the way that I do in a new setting and see what emerges really. It's always difficult to to um, categorize things like that. That's what I find. You know, mm. it's especially if you look at if you look at different uh, different street photographers. There's so many different different vibes and outsides. Yeah. I find it very difficult. I don't think you have to categorize. Sometimes it can help you focus if you put yourself into a category. But why? Why do just shoot what you like? Mm. Shoot what you like, and that that's it. If you start shooting what you don't like, and you start, mm, but maybe I should be in this this category and that means I can't shoot that. Nah, rubbish to that. No, I'm not on, not on board with that. I think you just shoot what you enjoy, what, what you like, and ultimately you're going to end up with better, better work. I mean, the way, the way I kind of split it up is the only, the only kind of category shooting I do is, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> hello cat. Just saying hi. Um, the, the only, the only way I, the only category stuff I do is portrait photography. So I am a portrait photographer. And when I'm doing mm. that, it's portrait photography. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of think about it as I do portrait photography and then there's everything else. And I don't really try and define the everything else. It just happens to be whatever I take photographs, wherever I am. But then I go, I'll go into portrait mode, whether that's natural light or in the studio. So that's the only kind of stuff I box. Because I had that whole journey with street photography in particular, where I started shooting on the street and then would put hashtag street photography because like, I don't know what else to call it. And then street photographers would come along and say, this isn't street photography. Stop calling it that. And I'm like, okay. And then I kind of started looking around online going, well, what is it then? Like, what, what do you call it? And then I found photographers like Fan Ho and Ray Metzger and even some of Trent Park's stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's fine then. So, so these guys also aren't street photographers. So I'm whatever they are that maybe you don't have a name for because it, it is just whatever it is. And, with, and th at that point, I just gave up naming stuff. I'm like, well, mm. I'm a portrait photographer who also shoots a bunch of other stuff. And you can argue about which box to put it in while I'm shooting if you want, but I'm not really interested mm. in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just the way I think about things. You know, uh, it's, you, you see all these comments all the time. Is it really this? Is it really? No, who cares? I find it difficult, you know, especially with social media um, and especially with, with Instagram where there's always, there's always this, this sort of latent pressure of like, you know, organizing your feed and all that kind of stuff and keeping mm -hmm. consistent and blah, blah, blah. And I sort of, I think I've given up on that some time ago where I'm just, I don't know. It's just a potpourri of different things I mean, that I'm experimenting with. Ultimately, who are you trying to please with your feed on Instagram? No, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's, 
photos of photos. Maybe that's maybe that's why I only have three followers. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> there's lots of different ways to book consistency in your work, though. I don't think mm. I don't think the subject matter in my images is very consistent, but there's a consistent style in there because it's how I like. It's the things I like to shoot. It's the way I I see light. It's how I like to yeah. to to. It's the amount of contrast I like in an image. It's the amount of it's the sort of colors that I'm drawn to. So even though I might shoot a lot of different things, mm. uh, kind of all over the place, uh, people will say, "Oh, I could tell that was one of yours when it came down the feed," because of those other consistency elements mm. that I build in, and those are stylistic. And they're not. I don't bully myself with that. It's not like I'm forcing myself to shoot that way. I like the way that looks. And so I put it into every image because I choose to, and, I, and, and it changes over time as well. It's constantly evolves because I want to tweak it as I go along, but it's, it's, it's not like a, a lot of people seem to think consistency is a bad word because it's, you're, you're almost oppressing yourself, forcing yourself into a box that you can't get out. Well, if that's how you see consistency, you definitely shouldn't do that to yourself, but I don't yeah, think right. that's consistency. It's, it's, it's allowing a style to emerge. Every photographer you look up to has a style you can recognize. Do you really think they're doing it because they're being draconian to themselves and forcing themselves to shoot a particular way? Or do you think that's the way they like to make images? It's a joy to do it that way. It's, it's, it, it often comes, I think, from beginner photographers who don't yet, they haven't had long enough for their style to emerge organically. And so they're frustrated by this idea that they need consistency in their work. So they reject it and they're angry that anyone would suggest that's something they need. Well, if that's how you feel, you're right. You don't need it yet. You're still beginning. You're a starter. So create and make a massive mess because it's the best way to learn. And do it with a smile on your face because it, it, you shouldn't have a style or consistency until it starts to emerge naturally. Um, and before that is all about play, I reckon. It's a bit like it, just taking it back to music because I think people can relate to that in a, in a slightly easier way than what we do um, visually with photography is that you hear a song... And if you know the band in any way, you know who it is performing mm. that song, even if it's a cover, even yeah. if they're not, you can't hear the vocal at that point. So you can just pick out, oh, that's his voice, definitely. You know who's who's done it, right? You know exactly who it is. Yeah. And that's the way I, I think about that that kind of thing, is even if you go through albums one and two, which will invariably sound very similar. But not album three. But not album three. That's always going to be different because they're finding, <laughs> they're, they're, they're on a journey as well. They're finding a new weight. You still know it's them. You still know, you know, well, I'll, I'll mention Coldplay one more time. I had a cracking <laughs> first couple of albums, really, if you think about it. What happened after that is probably best not talked about, but you still know it's them. I can give you a great example. ZZ Top, first 12 albums, exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> the 80s. <laughs> That's what things change. But you know what I mean, though? It's, it, I, I do find that people, but certainly I find this type of conversation relating it to audio um, far easier, I guess, because I've done audio for a lot longer in my it's, life. It's um, also, it doesn't, you know, it, um, I find you can draw so many parallels um, between between virtually all the creative arts. It doesn't really, you can you can go into, into painting, you can go into, um, you know, sculpturing, is that a word? Sculpturing. Sculpting. Sculpting, that's it. Sculpturing. Um, you know, whether it's uh, filmmaking, it's the same, you know. It really ultimately, you know, that's, that is just how creativity works, you know? Yeah. Um, and in the beginning, it, music is a really good example. I mean, especially, especially the guitar is a really perfect example for this because as a guitar player, you start out by copying loads of other players. That's what mm -hmm. you do. You, you know, you learn a Hendrix solo and you learn some Van Halen and you learn some Billy Gibbons and you learn some, I don't know, Led Zeppelin or whatever. And then years down the line, what emerges out of all of that chaos is you, your mm. voice. And it's unique because your influences have been unique. You know, like, you know, I grew up with, with listening to Billy Gibbons because that was just, you know, it just struck, literally struck a chord with me. Mm -hmm. um, and then everything else came about. So I sound different from the guy next door who, you know, started listening to Metallica and then, you know, whatever. I mean, it's basically, it's the, the culmination of all of these different micro influences over time will then just you know mold you into who you are yeah. and if you know people go like oh well you know david gilmore has a very recognizable style um and slash and whatever yes but you know they did exactly the same thing i mean it's yeah. you know the reason why they sound like slash 
or why David Gilmour sounds like David Gilmour is because probably David Gilmour sounds like David Gilmour because as a kid, he used to listen to lots of really boring guitar players. Yeah. And that's how he turned out to be as boring as he is. <laughs> but that's why it's so important. You to Pink go. Floyd. We just lost a whole bunch of Pink Floyd fans. Yeah, sorry. By the way. <laughs> but that's why it's so important to go, if you look at those guitarists, go, well, who did they listen to? Yeah, well, exactly. That can't, that's not difficult to find out. Go and listen to them as well. Give you an yeah, idea of how they developed and incorporated all those yeah. styles. Same with photography. Oh, absolutely. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. It's, it's a, or, or, or or filmmaking. Go and look to the, look at those directors mm. who you know what were they watching when they were kids? How did they develop their style? So this this actually brings me to this question: Who are your photography idols? Apart from us, obviously. Sure, yeah. <laughs> it goes without saying. Um, so I, was, uh, I reckon. I mean, obviously, obviously, the the ones I mentioned, Fan Ho, Ray Metzger, Trent Park, those kind of people are mm. are kind of the light and shadow play people who I really enjoy. They've definitely influenced and given me permission to sort of. I almost started shooting that way before I knew who any of them were as well. Someone would comment on an image and go, "Oh, this reminds me of Fan Ho," and I'm like, "Who the hell is that?" And you go look him up and go, oh, "Okay, he's already done this long before I did, and much better than me." So it kind of just gave me permission to keep going. Um, uh, Edward Hopper, the painter, was another one who I, I, yeah. I really like his stuff as well. Hmm. So those, those th that's kind of a loose collection for that. The portrait side, I reckon people like um, Peter Lindbergh, who did uh, fashion photography, but in a very gritty, um, very naturalistic style, which I really, mm -hmm. uh, which I really like. Um, Irving Penn, like is a, a, an old kind of classic photographer, who I think really, really kept things very simple and clean and, and focused on drawing the humanity out of his subjects, which I, I thought was beautiful. Um, Steve McCurry's like travel stuff has been like amazing to look at. Um, Joey Lawrence, Joey L, the photographer out of New York, who's a, he's younger than me. He's, he's a phenomenal photographer, more specifically his personal projects um, in the Omo Valley and uh, Varanasi and uh, some of the sort of, uh, cultural stuff he's done, I've really, really enjoyed and think think mm. is great. Um, so those are kind of some of the, um, yeah, those are, those are some of those people. I mean, and then I mean, there's the obvious ones, uh, people who like Salgado um, and and, but him more as a person. I think like I use him as an example in the book as of somebody who who sees problems in the world and has a skill with a camera and decides to combine those two things to see if he can make a difference. So he goes and photographs refugees for years, um, which takes a toll on him just so he could show the rest of the world what they need to fix. And then he takes himself around and starts photographing the natural world in black and white film to bring out Genesis to say, look, guys, we're destroying the planet. He's just got an amazing heart for the world and seems to really want to, um, make a difference with this skill that he's picked up and this passion he has for, for photography. Um, photographer like um, uh, Sally Mann's work I love, um, especially her kind of intimate family stuff is, is, is stuff I'm fascinated by and too scared to try. But I know there's something to learn from that work that's just really brave and beautiful. I love that stuff. Um, Joel Meyerowitz is, mm. is someone who I really enjoy a lot because... Um, as someone else, I think it like produces beautiful portraits, but we, we always think of Joel, you know, on, on fifth Avenue in New York with Gary Winogran in the eighties shooting street photography on those corners. Um, that's what he's most known for, but he's got a really eclectic body of work. He's built up over the years with like, um, lots of portrait stuff and large format stuff and 35 mil stuff. And then, um, shooting still life in his Tuscan villa and then, you know, selfies during lockdown because that's what he did. You can't stop him taking photographs. And he's always impressed me as somebody who will just take photographs wherever he is of whatever he sees and he won't get locked into a, a genre. And I, I, that's kind of given me kind of permission just to do whatever the hell I like and see where it lands. And I, I like that as well. I mean, there's lot, there's lots, honestly, I could just keep listening, mm. but yeah, there's lots of, there's lots of people who've, who I just keep in front of me constantly, you know, and, and, and keep looking at what they did and what they keep doing and, and just those tiny bits. Because like you said, with musicians, I think your style will always be your personality, who you are, what your story is that then gets cut with your stable of heroes and what they did and how, and what you resonate with in their work. And somewhere in the mix of that big soup and hopefully 
it's not just one hero you're trying to copy and paste. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people and you're paying real attention to who you are and what you want to say as well and what's important to you. It all gets put into that soup and a style emerges and a, and a focus emerges out of that. I think it's important, you know, as you say, to, to know who's behind someone who they looked up to. Um, you know, it's, it's been incredibly important to me over the years. And, you know, I think anyone checking out um, your work um, and who you are is worth going, to, worth going back and checking out all, all of those great photographers you just listed out. Um, yeah, so go check them out. Yeah. It's always it's always fun when you're trying to emulate somebody and somebody else it comes up to you and actually pinpoints exactly who you were trying to emulate. Like I had this. Um, in fact, we, we yeah. were talking about this very uh, earlier. Um, Nick and me went out to do some street photography, um, and uh, this was when was this in December, wasn't it? We went to Brighton. Yeah, we went to oh yeah, yeah, we went to Brighton to do some street photography um, because things were hotting up um, in London. And, uh, you know, the COVID cases went through the roof. And so we kind of decided it wasn't going to be a smart move to go into town. So we went out to the coast um, and it was a really sunny day. And I, I just, um, I've been looking at your, at your Instagram profile and I was looking for these pockets of light. So there was, there was, um, there was your stuff and then there was uh, Nina Walsh Kling stuff. And I kind of thought, well, if I can, if I can kind of take that as like a framework that gives me something to focus on. And that's exactly what I was trying to do. And I did, um, I was lucky enough to get a few shots and then somebody went, oh, this looks exactly like a Sean Tucker photo. I'm like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Last video I watched. <laughs> so so there you go. Nailed it. <laughs> I know, totally. So Sean, what, what's on your plate for the next few months? I mean, at the moment, it's all kind of focusing on um, uh, getting this book out to the world. So I'm just trying to... Um, market that a little bit it's the stuff i hate doing you know so talking about something you've done but you kind of have to do that work otherwise you can't expect mm -hmm. that new people will find it so there's a lot of that going on and then you know uh, trying to get one or two videos onto the channel every month as well slowly starting this photography project that i mentioned and then and then just going out and photographing as much as i can i can and as often as i can to do the the annual book of photography i do at the beginning of every year so next year will be collection five that'll come out in january and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to have kind of a target. I mean, my life, my life is fairly neatly sort of, um, put into targets in, in uh, all I really have to do is I try and post an image every single day onto Instagram. I mean, there's no way you can post a good image every day. I'm not that good a photographer, but at least just something that I find interesting or that's interesting about, or, or an image I took that I learned something from, I try and do that every day. So it gives me a target of, shooting enough images that I at least think there's something in it that I can post one a day to Instagram. Then of those, I whittle that down. I need 90 of those to be strong enough to go into the book for the following year. And then of those, I might sell 10 as print. So that's, that's kind of the loose targets I have with photography. Um, and then, yeah, one to two videos a month. And uh, yeah, trying to get the book done. I've just set up a, a studio in my garage, which hmm. uh, I'm getting dialed in and and making sure that everything is uh, ready to go. And then slowly starting to do portraits for people in the area as well. Not mm. charge for money. I just want to kind of meet people, dial that space in so that when projects start to roll, I can literally just have people come in and, and I can plug in and shoot in seconds and know exactly how to get the looks that I want. Um, mm. Yeah, and I've got, um, we're looking at a potential um, creative retreat in October. It's not definite right now. It's something that we planned for June last year, but it was in Northern Italy, which was not a good place to be in June last year. <laughs> um, so we're trying to get that back up and running again. Um, and hopefully I, I would love to get over to the States this year if travel allows to go and promote the book a bit and do some meetups mm. in, in a few cities, which would, would be really cool. Uh, yeah, so just all that stuff ticking along and then, you know, setting up this this new home or house and making it a home and meeting new people and getting locked in and meeting kind of the area and finding a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> it's always difficult, isn't it? Because it, no matter what it is in the sort of creative world, you know, people always say to you, oh man, it must be so great, you know, turning your hobby into your job. And you go like, well, it may seem like that, but actually once you've done that, you're actually out of a hobby. Yeah. True. You know, yeah, I still, I still love it. I just know I need something else that, that, 
that doesn't have the pressure on it that this does. You know, if you, if I go back to, you know, waiting tables or something to make money, I'll be taking photographs on weekend for myself and really love it. But at the moment, I love it. Plus, it's got a lot of pressure to to, to work a particular way. Um, yep. So I, you know, I've been looking at like, do I get into cycling or stand up paddle boarding or just something that there's no pressure on it is literally just to do in downtime for fun. Yeah. That I love that it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it works or doesn't work, you know. So that's it. We have come to the end of episode 71 of the Camera Shake podcast. Sean Tucker, thank you so much for being on the show. It was an absolute delight. And um, and in fact, I should just end, uh, mention that when, you know, when we first decided to have guests on the show at the very, very beginning, like some almost 70 episodes ago, your name was at the very top of yes, my it list. It was actually uh, the very cool. first number one name of people. You know, we're starting to think like, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, um, and uh, and so I'm, I'm really delighted that, you know, we finally um, made it happen. So thank you so much for, for being on the show this week. Um, again, the uh, the book, The Meaning in the Making is available on, on Amazon and in any good bookstore. Go and order there. The links, we're going to put a link in the description, mm -hmm. obviously. That'd be cool. That being said, Remember that if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, you make over you head over to uh, make sure you head over to youtube.com forward slash camera shake, uh, where you can see our lovely faces in full Technicolor. Other than that, we will be back next Thursday. We will indeed. Yeah.